Hello and welcome to this edition of Arts Legacy Remix. We are the Arts Legacy Remix team. And we are super excited about the great response to our Arts Legacy Remix online. And today, we have a very special presentation for you. You know that Arts Legacy is all about celebrating the richness of the culture and the beauty of Tampa Bay. And nothing is more beautiful than our children. And so over the summer, the team has had a conversation and we are excited to present to you in this edition of Arts Legacy Remix, old stories for a new generation. So sit back and enjoy. And Nancy is one of the most popular storytelling characters nations heard throughout the Caribbean, the US and Africa. Originally derived from West Africa, Anansi is typically portrayed as a spider that's known as a trickster and somebody wants to get something for nothing. Bottom line though, there's always a story and a lesson to be learned. I'm going to share with you an adaptation of a story that was created by Michael Ong called Anansi and the Yam Hills. Once, in a time called before, there lived an old woman that had magical powers. Her name was Five, but she never liked her name much because as she was growing up as a child, people would make fun of her. So as the years went by, she would get angrier and angrier and more evil, so much so that they called her a witch. By the time she grew up to be an adult, she decided she'd had enough of the name calling. So she created this special spell. <laughs> From this moment forward, anyone that says the number five shall disappear. This was not good for the country because that meant no one could utter that number without disappearing. Crafty Spider and Nancy lived in the same village as five. And he decided He'd heard about this strange spell and there had to be some way he could benefit from it. You see, times were tough. He was hungry. So he came up with a plan. He went down to the road that was right beside the market village. He set himself up under a tree. Himself up under the tree with five mounds of really rich brown soil. On the top of each mound, he put a small piece of African yellow yam and watered them every single day. So eventually they started to sprout. He called them his yam hills. A little bit more time went by and Anansi was there underneath the tree when he spotted Brother Bull passing by. Brother Bull had just come from the market and he was there with a big basket of fruit on his head. <laughs> bro, 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 brother Bull! <laughs> Come, 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 come. Let me see if you can help me. <laughs> My parents, they were poor. They never sent me to school. I never learned my ABCs or how to count properly. Could you help me count my yam hills? Make sure they're okay. Well, of course, Anansi. I can do that for you. <laughs> yes, uh, here's, you have one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and before you knew it, Brother Bull, <sighs> disappeared. And the basket of fruit that was on top of his head came crashing to the ground, whereby Nancy quickly ran, gathered up all the vegetables, and ran home where he ate all of them. That was the scam. And every day, Nancy would find new victims. So much so that Nancy started to get quite fat. One particular morning, Mrs. Guinea Fowl was on her way home from the market. And Nancy spotted her. <laughs> Mrs. Guinea Fowl, Mrs. Guinea Fowl, come, 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 come. I wonder if you can help me. You see, I never learned how to count properly. Could you help me count my yam hills? Now, Mrs. Guinea Fowl was no fool. She saw when a Nancy made a fool out of Brother Bull. So she decided to play along. So she walked up to his yam hills and stood on top of the fifth mound and said, well, Nancy, of course I can help you. Yes, you have one, two, three, four, and the one I'm standing on. This made Nancy upset. Well, 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 that's not right. That's not how you count. What kind of number is the one I'm standing on? I'm never here that, that. No, 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 you need to do it again. You have one, two, three, 
before than the one I'm standing on. This did not please Anansi at one bit. He started to scream and yell and said, that's not right, that's not the way you're doing it. Well, if that's not the way you count, then you show me and tell me what I should do. Said Anansi, I'm sure people do things the right way. This is the way you count. You count this way. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, oops. Of course, then Anansi disappeared. Mrs. Guinea then looked around and saw all of the fruits and vegetables that Anansi managed to con out of everybody that day. So, of course, she didn't want them to spoil. She gathered them and took them home to her family. What is the lesson? The lesson in the story is sometimes whenever you try and play people for a fool, when you're too greedy, the only fool that's there ends up being you. I'm Dr. Sybil Johnson, theater professional and storyteller, and member of the Arts Legacy Team. It's my pleasure to introduce to you part of my legacy, two of my grandchildren, Wesley, age five, and Sophia, age seven. They'll be telling you a story about a wonderful giraffe, the story written by their mother, who taught them the tradition of African storytelling, just as it was taught to her by her mom. Enjoy. Hello everybody, today we're reading Nota the Giraffe, written by Sophia Nagesti Johnson. A long time ago, in a land not too different from here, there lived a family of giraffes. On a starry night, a mama giraffe had a baby. The sky was clear and the day had been calm. The birth of her baby made the night breezes sweeter than usual. Mama giraffe knew immediately that her baby's name would be Nyota. Nyota means star in Kiswahili. Nyota grew up quickly, and she was the calm giraffe in the family. Even when her brothers and sisters played loudly or got into fights, or when danger came near the family, Nyota remained as calm as the day was when she was born. One thing Nyota loved to do, I mean, she almost could not help herself, was to gaze at the the stars. Every night after dinner, she could be found in her favorite spot looking up at the sky. She knew all the constellations by heart, and Nyota saw more shooting stars than any giraffe. Maybe more than any of the animals in the savanna. As Nyota grew older, the elders began telling her that she should focus on more productive things and that gazing at the stars every night was a waste of time for a grown-up giraffe as she would one day be. Still, Nyota kept studying the stars and feeling their beauty as often as she could. One day the giraffe knew they had to move on to another home. They were not sure where to go, but they knew they would run out of food and water if they remained there. The elders didn't know what to do as they had lost their sense of adventure and imagination. Their senses were also not as good as they used to be, and they needed help. One wise elder remembered that the stars could tell you in which direction you should travel. So they called Nyota. That night, the elders relied on Nyota to help find the way to their next home. With her help, Nyota's whole family was able to follow the stars and find their way to their new home. Uh, 
place with plenty of water and plants. Even though Nyota never stopped believing in her love for the stars, it was nice to know that now her whole family understood how important it was to Nyota's mom smiled as she saw a few giraffes start gazing together and knew again that she named her daughter with the perfect name, Nyota. The end. Up next is illustrator Lisa J. Michaels. As a professional illustrator for over a dozen published children's books, this St. Petersburg native looks for written stories that will challenge her artistically and allow her to explore new avenues in visual storytelling. She creates her illustrations by merging age-old drawing techniques with new world digital programs such as Procreate and her iPad Pro, resulting in detailed, colorful illustrations that bring picture book characters to life. She has been published in magazines, authored many articles, taught hundreds of in-person painting classes, and has a strong following as an online teacher, coach, and children's book editor. Without further ado, I welcome you to enjoy Lisa's interpretation on storytelling. Everybody has a story. Visual stories are all around us. I've always been able to see them. Other people's stories taught me about the world through each person's unique perspective. My story? It's as detailed as my multi-layered drawings, and the details never leave me. When I was a kid, we moved around a lot, so I never had picture books. I didn't even know what the inside of a library or a bookstore looked like. But I always knew that I was an artist. I also knew that one day I would use that art to tell stories. Every day that I spend putting little pieces of myself into my work, I get my childhood back. That shy little girl gets to come out and play. And that is pure joy. Come along with me as I illustrate the page from Martin the Mouse in Santa's house. With it snowing outside, I imagine the room would be toasty and magical, like fireflies flitting about on a warm summer evening. So I thought, why not tree trunks for bedposts with stars hanging from the branches? I doubt if the author thought of that. In this scene, Santa's chief elf comes running in and breaks the peaceful slumber of the elves. He yells, there's a mouse in Santa's house! As a tiny mouse hops from bed to bed, doing his best to avoid being caught. Illustrations don't just help to tell the story. They also add something to the story, showing you things that the words do not tell you. In this illustration, I decided to hang pictures of each of the little elf's grandpa at the head of the bed, as if they're watching over them, keeping them safe. You won't find that in the text, but I thought it was a nice touch. I also thought that it would be really nice to add some steaming mugs of hot chocolate, another thing that wasn't mentioned in the story's text but I felt like it just had to be included, along with a few peppermint sticks. I hope you enjoy following along as I add in all the little details that make this illustration really special and fun for me. And in comes the chief elf. I always hoped I'd get the opportunity to create a book about Santa and his elves at the North Pole. It was a dream come true. 
but I never imagined that they'd be chasing a mouse. Now you know how illustrators think when they are visually telling a story through a picture book. If you'd like to learn how to write a children's picture book, I offer in-depth step-by-step classes at www.skillshare.com. If you're interested in self-publishing a children's book and you need a professional illustrator, visit my website and leave me a message. Even if my work isn't the style you're looking for, I can connect you with a wonderful illustrator. And finally, keep your eyes and ears open. There are incredible stories everywhere you look. Hello everyone, my name is Maxine Reyes and I'm the author of the next story that you'll be listening to. It will be read by my daughter, Victoria Reyes, who is also the illustrator. I wanted to inform you that the story mentions the discipline of students in school. I also wanted you to be informed that this occurred in the 1980s in a different country that no longer practices this form of discipline among students and children. I hope you enjoy this story. I try to keep it as authentic as possible, and I hope you take away at least one lesson from it. Let me introduce to you our reader for today, Victoria Reyes. Hello, everyone. Today, I'll be reading from a book called From the Root to the Fruit, the story of a Jamaican country girl, written by Maxine Reyes. Chapter 1. Beyond Time for School Once upon a time, there was a girl who lived in the countryside of Jamaica. Her name was Gwen. Gwen lived in Marley Hill, located in the parish of Manchester, a small village where everyone knew her name, and everything was conveniently located. The corner store was nearby, the library was not too far, and the community school was just a sprint away. Gwen was fortunate enough to live right across from her elementary school. Although she lived close to the school, she would wait till the last minute to run across the street. Gwen thought she was so clever and did this every day. She was a track and field athlete and knew how to beat the clock. In Jamaica, the first ball gives you 60 seconds to make it to your seat before the tardy bell rings. Gwen was so fast, she would always be in her seat before the tardy bell rang. Gwen was so confident in her speed, she would stay up late reading mystery books like the Bobsy Twins, Nancy Drew, and Hardy Boys. Nancy Drew were her favorite. She would read these books by the light of an old-fashioned kerosene lamp. In the morning, Gwen would sleep as long as she could to allow her just enough time to tend to the family's animals, goats, pigs, chickens, and, and a cow, all while making herself porridge to break the fast and then dash off to school. One day, Gwen woke up later than usual. Her traditional breakfast of porridge took longer than expected, and she was finally late for school. She was forced to face the government belt, what is the government belt, you ask? It's a training tool found in Jamaican public school systems that is designed to readjust, readjust student behavior, which really means it's a piece of stiff leather used to discipline students when they misbehaved or are late for school. In other words, it was used to spank the students. That morning, Gwen had to line up with the other late students and received a whipping from the principal. She was so humiliated. Poor Gwen learned a valuable lesson that day. She learned that being fast is great, but being on time is more important. India, a land of many diverse and distinct cultures, and one of the oldest civilizations, home to many rich and powerful stories. These stories have been told through music, drama, dance, and traditional oral storytelling. Many of the stories are steeped in religious beliefs, yet intertwined with folklore. Sheila Pachamani Narainen represents the story of poet Saint Mira and her love and devotion to Krishna. I bring you Mira. 
The palace grounds of the Maharaja of Kutki, Rajasthan, reverberated from the festivities of a joyous wedding procession passing by. The smell of roses and jasmine filled the air as the groom, seated on a finely decorated elephant, ceremoniously rode past. Watching the scene intently from one of the palace windows was the Maharaja's five-year-old daughter, Mira. She was so excited because she had never seen such a grand wedding procession before. Innocent and curious, she suddenly asked her mother, Ma, who is my husband? Her mother, the queen, quickly took Mira to the statue of beautiful Krishna within the palace and said, Ah, from today, this is your husband. If you take care of him, he'll take care of you. From that moment on, Mira actually believed that she had married Krishna. She spent all of her time singing and dancing in honor of this divine husband. A few years later, Mira got married to the handsome Prince Bojraj of Chittor. After the royal wedding, Mira joined her husband's family in Chittor. Her husband, who would eventually become king, loved Mira immensely. And Mira played the role of the royal wife to perfection. But at the end of each day, she would disappear to the palace temple to sing and dance in honor of her divine husband. News of Mira's singing and devotion soon reached the ears of the neighboring ally kingdoms and the neighboring enemy kingdoms, including the Mughal Emperor Akbar. Despite knowing the hatred that Rana Bodraja's kingdom had for the Mughals, Emperor Akbar wanted to hear Mira for himself. When news reached the Rana that the Mughal emperor had come to hear his wife sing, he was livid. He asked Mira how she, a Rajput princess, could allow the Mughal emperor into her temple. Mira didn't answer him. She could only think of Krishna. The Rana finds her silence to be arrogant and in a fit of rage says, Mira, go drown yourself in the nearest river. The ever dutiful wife that she was, Mira didn't protest or argue. As she stood at the nearest riverbank, ready to jump in, she saw her beautiful statue of Krishna had come to life. Krishna then told her to go to Vrindavan and continue her prayers there. News reached the Rana that his Mira was still alive. He hurriedly left his palace to bring Mira back home. A few more years went by and sadly and unexpectedly, the Rana got sick and died. Mira was now left all alone in a palace full of people who didn't like her or understand her ways. Rana Bodraja's brother, the new Rana, had always been jealous of Mira's growing popularity. He tried many ways to get rid of her, but nothing worked because Krishna always saved her. Several years later, Mira set off in a final search for her beloved Krishna. As she reached Dwaraka, the city that he ruled, she could hear Krishna calling her closer and closer as Mira sang and danced in complete devotion, she fell in surrender to her Krishna, and Mira and her beloved Krishna were finally one. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. Every day is such an incredible experience. And one of the wonderful things that I've had the opportunity to do as I travel around the world and create music and share story with young people from all over the globe is the importance and beauty of every single day. So I wrote a song and I'd like to share it with you. It's a song that many people around the world sing every single day just to remind them that every day is a blessing. It goes like this. Today is a new day. The sun is in the sky. Today is a new day. The sun is in the sky. 
Can't you see the sunlight shining so high? Can't you see the sunlight shining so high? Come quickly, come quickly, I've something to say. I'll wake up this morning and greet the new day. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, it's wonderful. Now what I want to invite you to do right now is sing this song along with me. I'll sing one line, you sing it back. Are you ready? Here we go. Today is a new day, the sun is in the sky. Sing, today is a new day, the sun is in the sky. Today is a new day, the sun is in the sky. Sing, today is a new day, the sun is in the sky. Can't you see the sunlight shining so high? Sing, can't you see the sunlight? shining so high can't you see the sunlight shining so high sing can't you see the sunlight shining so high come quickly come quickly i've something to say sing come quickly come quick I have something to say. I wake up this morning and greet the new day. Sing. I wake up this morning and greet the new day. Oh, it's wonderful. Sing. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, it's wonderful. Sing. Oh, it's wonderful. Now this is a song that you can sing each and every day, reminding you that each day is wonderful. Even if there's a cloud in the sky, it's still a wonderful day. So much to learn, so much to do along your way. So remember that each and every day is oh, oh, oh wonderful come quickly come quickly i've something to say i wake up this morning and greet the new day oh, oh, oh it's wonderful oh, oh, oh it's wonderful <laughs> So we want to thank each and every one of you for joining us for this evening's Arts Legacy Remix. We hope you enjoyed getting to meet even more artists in the Tampa Bay and getting to see the beautiful culture that we get to weave together. We can't wait till you guys get to join us back at the Strata Center at our home with the Riverwalk stage, being able to engage with everyone. So in the meantime, please like, share, comment on this video as well as the others and have a good night. Thank you.